All right, we're going. No, the slow clap. You gotta. I feel like I'm being trolled right now. Like that. <clears throat> Six and a half hours later. You're in the comfort zone. I didn't know that was a thing. I'm a little jealous. So we're back in Randy's fish room. And we're here for a tour. We got Jimmy in this time to get the B-roll. And uh, I feel like we gotta start over already. No, <laughs> no, roll yeah, with it, roll with it. it. Just leave it, it in, leave it in. But I want to start with the discus because that was the thing that I thought you put on a lot of size in the last six, eight weeks, whatever that is. So fill us all in because if the fans haven't watched every video we've done, they don't know the backstory on these. Yeah, so the backstory with the, the discus, these are wild Peruvian discus that we brought back uh, from the most recent trip down, to, or my first trip, uh, rather in, what did we go, July or August? August. Yeah, so we went collecting uh, in the Amazon. These ones, however, came from the, the wild discus farm. I don't really know what that means. Which, there's a video that, that I had put out of, of this trip. Uh, you and Dean actually hadn't arrived yet. Um, and so I got 10 wild discus. Uh, a couple of the people in the group got some other discus from this uh, wild discus farm. And uh, these may or may not be them, actually, because we did lose them on the boat, unfortunately, to overcrowding and just lack of oxygen. And uh, but, eating them. And, and, and then we ate them, yes, yeah. which <laughs> people do know about. So that was good times. Discus, not the, not the tastiest fish, not the worst, though. Um, so yeah, these are these are, are potentially them or they're some that we just got at the exporter to fill in for the ones that, that died Nonetheless though, they're wild straight from Peru, which is which is amazing um, This is the one fish that going on the trip. I wanted to go for the experience But if I was going to bring something back, it was hundred percent gonna be a wild discus So the fact that we were able to go to the discus farm um, and secure these kind of day one of the trip was amazing uh, I brought 10 back. Unfortunately, the largest one um, it just did not do well. It wouldn't right itself. I tried all, you know, salt and lowering the water level and all those, all those tricks. Um, it developed a very, very large sore on its side. And kind of the last day, it popped up and looked like it was doing fine after a pretty heavy salt treatment. Uh, but then after that, it just kind of succumbed, unfortunately. But yeah, now I've got nine left. Two in this tank, seven in that tank. They were all together at one time. Uh, but I've since moved them because I feel that what Corey was just showing you was... Uh, a, a pretty sure bet on a male female hopefully they haven't killed each other so that's always a good sign how big were they when you brought them back from peru um i feel like the largest that i had brought back was kind of the medium size in here some of them were actually fairly fairly small actually like the um so these domestic discus a couple of them were about that size and unfortunately uh these domestic discus in this tank are incredibly skittish right now so i'm doing things like putting in driftwood putting in some plastic fake plants to give them cover to help them feel more secure i've consulted with you i've consulted with yeah. dean um, i've done a lot of research online you know so these guys um, are just incredibly skittish right now where the wilds have you know that's they, crazy you would you yeah money would be opposite they, they acclimated within a within a week um you know week and a half and went from eating um live black worms to uh, extreme krill flake and so that was very very reassuring knowing that I could have a prepared food that had you know a lot of nutrients in it for them to give them a well-balanced diet and not just rely on black worms which ultimately wouldn't be great for them um, and then from for discus I then have some more uh, discus that actually you filmed in the unboxing yesterday so blue diamonds and a couple more tiger turquoise nice and the whole goal of this fish room you know it's kind of gone through a few ev evolutions um, I've, I've related it on the podcast to, you know, you start college, you don't know what your major is going to be, so you kind of dabble here and there, uh, where now I feel like I have found my major and what that is, is basically turning this into um, kind of a mini discus breeding facility. I've just fallen in love with the fish. Uh, I, you know, really, you know, really cemented my passion for them going to that uh, dragon discus uh, farm tour in China. That was, that was yep. a phenomenal visit. I'm so glad we had a chance to do that. And yeah, so, I mean, it's, you know, the king, the king of the, the tropical fish. Um, and then, you know, as we go through the rest of the tour, you'll see that I've got several tanks with different generations of angelfish fry. So I'm kind of considering that I'm, I'm cutting my teeth on breeding angelfish um, in preparation for growing out these discus and getting them to the point where I can then transition from having, you know, angelfish after angelfish generation uh, to then switching over and having discus. Yeah, you're not doing too bad. Got quite a few fry. And then you'll see. So what I've started doing is actually marking the generation so okay. uh, once I pull the eggs from a slate and what you'll notice you can kind of call this uh, a worse version of Dean's fish room so 
uh, you know, Dean, he's been in the hobby for so long. He's gone through so many iterations and so many different trials and errors. Like, why not just leverage his experience? And so for the most part, I've tried to take um, as much of what he does that I think would be successful for me and emulate it. So, you know, here's something that Dean does. And not just Dean, a lot of people do this, but nonetheless. Yeah. Um, little uh, methylene blue water and aeration for the eggs. Uh, what is it, like a three to four day period before they go to Wigglers. And then from there, they move to the fry hatching system but what i've yep. started doing though is marking with one of these liquid chalk markers the date so i can start tracking their age a little bit better the first few generations i didn't do that and i kind of kick myself in the butt because it'd be nice to know that oh yeah from egg laying to this point is when i'm able to take them into a store and have them be at a good sellable yeah. size um, so then you'll see here a fry system again very similar to what dean runs and explain, because I was giving you yeah. crap for them not being as clean as Dean's. And you yeah, have a so method your madness. So this, the other species of fish that I'm working with, or the other the other type of fish, are bristlenose plecos. And so in here, you'll see albinos. And so these guys uh, were laid, or I moved them over on 1220 uh, when I found the eggs in the cave. So or at a wiggler stage, I guess. So from 1220 to now, that's that's how big those guys are. Um, but this actually ends up being amazing for the bristlenose, uh, bristlenose fry, within a couple days, two, three days of hatching or going from wigglers to actually starting to graze, they'll have this completely clean and looking like that. Yeah. And so that's why this one, there's nothing in it right now, but it's just waiting for the next batch of bristlenose. And then I have a couple other fry trays off to the side for the next batch of angelfish. Mm -hmm. So I, I do want it sterile for the angelfish, but not for the bristlenose. And these are the parents? Are these the ones Those are, are the parents, yeah. These are the ones that are the, the proven breeders. And what are these? Piraba blues? Or what do they call these things? I, I, I think so. I don't even want to fathom it. I, I mean, I know what I bought them at, but yeah. uh, I, I can't remember the name 100%. I know angelfish people are very passionate when you go down that route and, you know, they get real into the, uh, into cool. the naming. That's all that matters. Yeah, they're, they're definitely, definitely beautiful. I had them flown all the way, halfway across the country, paid a pretty penny for them. Uh, unfortunately, I've got two females here for sure, um, and then these ones will lay. They obviously don't fight. Um, I just think maybe they just need some more reps as breeders, so they haven't mm -hmm. been together as long as these ones have. I'm holding out hope for these ones, uh, but those two are girls, and then this one in here is also a female. So, so I want to give a little insight to people that uh, are watching. How many did you buy originally? Like to so you knew you wanted to breed the angels. How many did you order up? Twelve. Twelve. Yeah, six of the leopard pattern, which actually both of these are that leopard tail pattern. Okay. And then six of the peri periaba, which yeah. this one down here is a pretty good representation of that. Um, apparently, they have the pearl scale genetic okay. marker or whatever you want to call it. So yeah. Okay. I can see that. And then up here, you'll see what they throw, and it's actually kind of a the ratio seems to hold generation to generation. Huh. And so you bought 12, you've got one breeding pair, but now you're cranking out the fry. How long do you think these will hit the aquarium co-op? I took one first generation in that I really wasn't trying. Um, you know, I was doing some, we were doing some travel, so I didn't want to do yeah. too much, you know, breeding and uh, hatching out fry and whatnot. So that I only got like eight fry out of, not even really trying. Those ones I took to the co-op probably about a month ago. And then last week I took this batch up, which okay. this batch would be maybe beginning of November, if I were to, if I were to fathom a guess. Yeah, when, you start, when, you, when they laid, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you got quite a few. So if you, by the time this video comes out, if people are interested, we should still have some in the store. I mean, they're going to sell quick, but they should be trickling in because you've got a few tanks full of them. Yeah, even some employees have taken some home too, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, for me being a, an aquarium co-op employee, you know, kind of in, in my position, uh, ever since I joined the team, like my, my perspective on the hobbies really shifted. And so now like I get in so much free food because we're doing samples, we're testing things out. I mean, we'll talk more about some of the stuff that's, that's being tested in my fish room, but it's just kind of one of my ways to give back to the co-op of, I don't even like, I don't do credits or any of that stuff really. I just, I take Robert in 50 angel fish and it's like, here you go. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know he'll order me up a couple discus, but in the end, those discus will just end up pretty much going back to the co-op. Right. So. I mean, you, you're you're <laughs> setting the stage for like what Dean kind of has going. You breed yeah. so many fish. We do pay Dean, but you know, same thing. You can walk in and ask for anything he needs. We'll get it, knowing that 
when success yeah. happens, it comes back yeah. for us. So. Yeah. Anybody that follows me on Instagram, they've seen pictures of me taking in entire buckets of albino bristle nose, uh, you know, juveniles of, yep, I'm clearing these out. I'm only keeping the male, bre the, the adult breeding pair, just take them into the co-op and, you know, just, you know, like I said, it's just kind of my way to give back. And, Is that your preferred uh, social media outlet, Instagram or? Uh, Instagram at this point, it's uh, with, with the podcast and you know just kind of family commitments the the podcast has really taken a back burner but you know I still post every once in a while the Instagram I've got a you know what I think are cool little videos of feeding angelfish uh, brine yeah. shrimp and whatnot but yeah Instagram uh, you can follow the Aquarius podcast Facebook page YouTube or you know listen to any of the episodes that are out there um, I want to talk about so raising angels and I think it's a good segue to you know what's behind you there and that is the brine shrimp station yeah, so this, um, I've gone through, so again, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see the kind of iterations of various brine shrimp hatchers that I've used. Um, one of them, actually, a, a recommendation of a, a podcast listener was to do this homebrew, maybe I'll, I don't know, Jimmy can get a shot of it on B-roll, but it's this giant funnel thing okay. that actually looks like something you'd see at a fish farm, um, at, at like a, maybe a small-scale fish farm, but it's used for home brewing. it's conical-shaped, and it's perfect if you want to do, like, I don't know, a cup of brine shrimp. Like it's, yeah. this sucker will hatch out a ton. So I've played around with that. And that whole goal was doing kind of the Greg Sage of hatch out a lot and then freeze some. Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, that was working a little bit, but I wanted to get on a more consistent rotation basis and just really uh, drill it in on hatching out brine shrimp. Go to the Dean method where you gotta hatch multiple times a day. It, exactly, yeah. Cause you know, kind of doing off and on brine shrimp hatching, you're like, oh, how many, what's the ratio of water to baking soda to brine shrimp to salt? And you know, now I'm at the point where I just know it's two tablespoons of hashtag unsponsored free plug Fritz. This is actually their RPM salt. So this is a salt water salt. I do two tablespoons of this in roughly, what is that, two liters? Uh, yeah. With, typically I'll do about a tablespoon of brine shrimp eggs. Um, I can push it up to a full, no, a teaspoon. I can push it to a full tablespoon, go real crazy like you do, yeah. uh, but that ends up being a ton of brine shrimp. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good to know that from one hatch, I've got a pretty significant range of, I can have a lot of fry mm -hmm. and feed out a lot of brine shrimp, but I only need to do a tablespoon right now. And I yeah. could probably get away with half a tablespoon to be honest, but I like overfeeding. So I wanna talk about these feeder or the, the brine shrimp hatcheries. We're testing them out long term. We want to, you know, we're testing different types of eggs. We're testing different hatchers. We're making, or well, we're trying to make improvements. Each one of these that are currently in front of you, there's things that we would like to change about them, which we haven't convinced, or you know, some we'd have made ourselves. Some we're trying to get the brands to make these tweaks. Um, and we, as we use them in Dean's fish room, my fish room, and Randy's fish room, they get a lot of actual hatch time going, and we think we can really make something that people are gonna enjoy. I think if Dean, myself, and Randy all come together and go, we love this one the best, mm -hmm. which we kind of have a favorite, but we haven't, you know, we, we know it can be better, and so we're trying to get the tweaks made before we really bring it to the US market. But we're still trying other stuff we have. We found another one just the other day that we wanna bring in and test against this, and uh, you know, same with eggs, we wanna get good eggs going and you know reliable yeah and on the point of eggs uh, so not only are these hatchers you know things that we aren't carrying that we're testing the eggs also are things that we're thinking about bringing on so the eggs that I'm hatching out um, I have been blown away with it says 95% on it like, yeah right like the best I ever see is you know premium grade 90% but you know if, if you could count it I would have to imagine that it was 95% or higher it was just it was phenomenal this color right here I mean it's far it's a far deeper red than the domestic brine shrimp that you're gonna get. And the fish obviously they, they love it. They're grow they grow very, very well on it. They're yeah. really nice, but These they do guys. collect some eggs and stuff. They so they're do. Mm -hmm. you know, while while it's got great quality, it's got like, oh this one and that's that's the I think the rub is which one because none of them are perfect so mm -hmm. which one has the best feature set is what we're trying to decide on really. What they have on here and I can go ahead and play with this right now is this handle thing. And I didn't think anything of it. I'm like, yeah, on the stand, it's terrible. I'm not a fan. I have the air coming in through the top. There's a lot of innovative features of it, but the practicality of people actually using them, you can put a heater in here, but it has to be a very specific size kind of heater. Um, this is a thermometer port. So there's a lot of things like theoretically, oh, that would be great to have. Yeah. But in practice, it just ends up being um, impractical. And then seeing what you and Dean did of actually hooking it on the side of the tank. Yeah, we could probably like, do it right here. Yeah. Just move one of these. Oh no, no, I've done it. 
But that, yeah, once once Dean figured that out, and then I started testing yeah. it, and then that's what actually made you test it again. Yeah, it was like, totally. And then actually, I had a piece of foam in here, so it would, so it would sit more level yeah. like that. Um, and then I went ahead and said, yeah, this is this is amazing. I love this. It just makes harvesting. And then I started running the air through this. Right, which um, makes more sense. And one then, of the reasons you you can hang it on the tank is the heater you can, issue. Yeah, you can tighten it off, let it settle. Yep. Air still going. I can plug it back in, and we'll be fine. The heater issue, you can yeah. actually put it in the tank. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's full of water, it'll sink in the tank. And if you're heating your aquarium, it doesn't look good. But you've got some options there. But we want to get a few changes. Yeah. We're, we're, well, we're, you know, we want to be, because it's not, it's not a cheap item. That's the other no, thing, it's too. Not. It's not cheap. It's made out of, you know, it's it's like that, like the plastic for these trays. It's like yeah. food grade, like yeah. that thing where you go to buy a train. You're like, how's that a $70 yeah. train? It's like, oh, it's used by hotels. You're like, oh, it's that kind of plastic. Yeah. And, and I like this as a vendor. I, I like my interactions with the company owner who's, you know, hobbyist, engineer guy, um, just loves tinkering. So I've got no problem saying that you can find this right now on eBay. You're going to yep. pay $45 plus $9 to ship it. Yep. So this is this is a premium product, right? It, it is, uh, this quality is amazing. And that's why we carry a few different ZIS products that fit um, what we do and what we sell. But, you know, you not a lot of people, I think, want to drop 50 bucks on a brine shrimp hatcher when they could say, I can get this, you know, Thing with a coke bottle on it for you know ten dollars and, and even if you do drop 50 bucks you really want it to work well you don't yeah. have to use your own diy exactly cap. like we're not using it in the way that the instructions will tell you to use it this yeah. is out of we keep sharing like hey i tried this i like this way better yeah. oh i'm doing this now what do you think about this yeah so. and, then, and then for me because i do love this so much and, and you know aside from testing um, I hope I hope it can work out where we can bring this product on. But just from my own personal use, um, I've come up with this two two by four system with a little bit of a wedge, painted it black, yep. so, and I measured it so it's just enough to take this handle in and to keep it nice and centered. And then whenever I switch, you know, just in case, because I was actually running three at a time, ah. and three ends up being way, it's just more than I need. Um, so then I just switch this so little thing. Now green whenever cap. I'm over, I'm just gonna move nope. that and it'll throw your whole game off. <laughs> You know, in a perfect world, if we could go and make our own again, I would change some things like I would have it be all black except for one bar. Kind of so, like what they're doing right here yeah. to an extent. So that way, when you have light, you can collect the eggs really easy. You still want to see how it's tumbling and everything, mm -hmm. but because there's light everywhere, I it is one of my complaints of it's not the easiest thing to collect the eggs. Like even with a bendy, you know, yeah. LED like you've got there to collect them. Yeah. It could, you know, if I was making my own and, you know, price is no object, cause I'm sure mixing black and clear all of a sudden is a different type of molding process yeah. or something. Yeah, my, my other takeaway from the fish farm tour is also that runs counter to kind of the, the YouTube shared knowledge out there is when you're hatching brine shrimp, the farms, they have it going like it's so much air going through like the amount of turbulence yes. in here if you watch a lot of videos out there of people that are hobbyist turned youtuber you know they'll tell you oh have a gentle kind of flow yada, yeah yada, you don't want to hurt the brine you shrimp. don't want to hurt the brine shrimp and we've been to farms where it's just going full blast yeah like full blast you know it, it's so much harder than what i'm doing here yeah. and you know it's one of those if the farm is doing it if they were killing gotta it left be, and right, gotta be pretty good, right? Yeah. If they were killing it, they would change it. Yeah. And these are farms that are kicking out, you know, tens of thousands of. Well, of the one in, one in Israel and, I went to, they were they were hatching out what was it, seven pounds of eggs a day. Yeah. So I'm pretty confident when you're handling that much brine shrimp, you've learned a thing or two. Yep. yep. So the next thing is your your next eBay find because I. When he went to China with me, I shared my love with the overhead filter, and then he yeah. could not bring or buy some. Well, this is this is when I was just a co-op fanboy, and you had talked about these. Oh, okay. And that was one of the first products that I'm like, hey man, should we should we bring this on when I join the team? Um, and so finally, knowing that in some of these tanks, as the bio load is getting so heavy, um, even though I have an auto water change system, I battle nitrite spikes. Yeah. Um, so. You know, knowing that I need to, and that's why there's two aqua clears on these discus tanks. Those were those were mothballed in my shed, and I pulled those out to get some more biological filtration because my auto water change, even though I'm doing like 20% a day, just isn't enough. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this is a this is a drip system, uh, an overhead trickle system that I bought off eBay. It technically has I think three more rows I could put on top, but due to space limitation, I'm obviously running this, which yeah. you know, four bio rings and this sponge pad, which I 
you didn't have a fifth, so I put it in one of the aqua clears, is better than not having it at all. Mm -hmm. um, so you buy this thing on eBay for 60 bucks, you know, it's coming straight from China, hitting an LA warehouse and getting shipped out from there. Great, you know, good stuff. You're getting, you're getting a product that you want. However, you know, if we were to carry this thing, other than it being massive and, you know, shipping challenges, um, this is not the original tubing. This is actually shark bite, um, what are they called? What, PEX? PEX yeah, tubing. PEX, yeah. So this is PEX tubing because the original tubing has so much flex in it that these don't sit flush. And the last thing you want is somehow for your, your tubing to come flying out. Mm -hmm. So I had, to, I had to do this. I had to find the right PVC size that would even fit in this spot. I had to drill both sides out. I then had to make sure it fit into this and then sealed it off with some uh, JB Weld. Uh, and then I still actually probably need to do a little bit more reinforcement um, at, at these two junctions right here. But nonetheless, like anything that we bring in, we want it to be good to go out of the box. Yeah, so, not while, a hardware store plus ordering. Exactly, so this is, yes, this is me as a hobbyist needing more filtration, but at the same time, it's, you know, as, as a, somebody that does sourcing and product sourcing for aquarium co-op, you know, and knowing the standards that we have, like, you know, it's, it's good to finally run one of these systems and kind of learn some of the pitfalls, learn some of the challenges, and know that when we go, like, any manufacturer we're going to partner with, you know, there's a quality threshold that we need to make sure that they can they can hit because it, it, it was really, really disappointing to drop, you know, 60 bucks on a product and then have to go to the hardware store and do, you know. I mean, that could have been a hang on back filter or something that you wouldn't have had to DIY at that point. But you do yeah. get the fun of now you know all about it, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And with, you know, the reason why I went with this instead of just another aqua clear is in a power outage, sometimes aqua clears have some trouble restarting and whatnot mm -hmm. where this it's a pretty simple system. It's just a, a pump going straight up. Yeah. Um, so your chances of flooding, as long as you do the plumbing right, are, are pretty minimal. I did have to run silicone on that bot, and, and they didn't even include the full length pipe. Oh, wow. So they're supposed to include a short pipe and a full length pipe. I didn't get the full length pipe, so I still need to email them about that. Who knows how what that customer service journey will be like. Yeah. Um, you know, conceptually and overall, I, I'm very happy I have it running. I might do a couple more, but you know, just know that it's unfortunately not a product that's at a level where we could bring it on. Um, and it would just need, you know, a bit more, a, well, a lot more improvement uh, for us. So, yeah. All right, next, Super Reds, because I know you're cranking those out. Oh, here, they're showing off for us. And these are the, st do you have long fin too, or? I do have long fin. These are actually, um, these are actually from the male female that I got from you. Oh, from my fish yeah. room, yeah. So your male-female pair are down here. Okay. They're probably hiding. Yeah, I'm sure. But everything else in here, everything that I've brought to the aquarium co-op um, has been from the, the male-female pair that I got out of your fish room. Nice. Worked out well, because I knew I didn't have time because I was traveling, and you were yeah. all excited about oh, yeah. them, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and Robert says that, uh, you know, people that have, been, that have seen these compared to the ones that we uh, bring in from our distributor, you know the, the the intensity of the red, and that's probably because they were in a tank with guppies, and they were getting just so much leftover uh, krill flake. Wow. Yeah, no, it's quite a few long fins in here. Pretty big. I think I did. I think five or six, and I honestly thought I wasn't going to get fry for probably another four or five months. You know, I I didn't know. I got these things, real real tiny juveniles, and just where did you get them originally? Uh, through our our co-op wholesaler. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and now. Just a couple days ago. Yeah. So I sent you and Robert messages of uh, woohoo and celebration that, you know, that, and that's one of the things that, you know, being working in the hobby and, you know, having that fear of getting burnt out on it and interviewing people and just kind of being so immersed that to be able to come into my fish room and be completely caught off guard by Fry and just to have this ecstatic feeling, um, you know, it's, it, it's awesome. Nice. It's fun when the, when the room's up and running and cranking stuff out, yeah. it's a good feeling of, you know, I go through bouts of totally being there and then totally not being there. Mm -hmm. I've even watched you kind of, when it gets lax and you're just like, oh, it's more of a chore. But once you get it back into the fun part, yeah. it's easier to stay, you know, with it, I guess. How long does feeding take you in this fish room? This fish room's like one and a half size of Dean's, I would say, maybe like 15 by 10 or something, or? Uh, I can feed this fish room and make a, next, a new batch of brine shrimp in probably 10 minutes. Okay, that's yeah. not bad. Yeah, the... Uh... 
So this is an API General Cure spoon. Nice. And this is uh, Extreme Curl Flake. I love these Ziploc containers. Because as mm -hmm. you as you talked about, I have mutant hands apparently. You do. So this <laughs> hand can actually. Go with the wide so mouth. yours will get swallowed in here. Yeah. yeah. So wide mouth, this little guy right here, and that really helps to feed all the higher up tanks. So I don't necessarily have to climb on the ladder. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, at some point we could. Yeah, these guys are. They're ready. Yeah. And so now these are on Krill Flake. Um, the moment they pretty much go in these these tanks, I'll probably give them another week on brine shrimp. And then I switch them over fully to uh, to flake food. Nice. Do you vary it up much, or is it pretty much just the flake food? No, I, I, I do vary it up because so this is a this is a flake food that we ended up not bringing on uh, because they decided to sell in one size and that one well amongst many reasons they they sell in a tub that looks like it belongs at Costco and that would yeah. probably be like a thousand dollars to ship it. Uh, but that's a food that I try. As a hobbyist, I've bought foods like, you know, a, a lot of tropical foods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously the, a lot of extreme foods that they sent us as initial samples before we even brought them on. Um, we've got other foods that could potentially be, you know, some import product for us. So spirulina wafers, some Hikari. I mean, there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of foods in here. So, um, yeah, yeah depending, depending on the tank. I yeah, feel this, like it's once a month there's a new food like got to test it and most of them just straight up not good move on you know yeah this one right here even though that has a red color like krill uh this is another flake that we are trying out i'm not even gonna say who, who it's from or what the ingredients are but this is yet another food that we're trying out in the fish room and it, it, it's great being able to try these foods out and to see the, the fish's reaction you know like the krill flake again broken record they're hitting it like like crazy um and then some of these other ones that you try it's like oh that ingredient that should be amazing right like in yeah. in flake form feed it out and either they don't hit it nearly as hard or they don't hit it at all and they yep. just end up having to gravel back it out um i've been there done that yeah so a lot of testing Ooh, and my favorite the viber bites yeah yeah viber bites this this fish room doesn't necessarily need it because um you know nothing in here is overly finicky I mean, the discus were in the beginning, but I ended up getting them on a prepared food. Uh, this is basically the last remnants of, uh, you know, when I was a co-op shopper, of my Viber Bites. I feed it out to the angels. They do like it. Um, you know, from an ingredient standpoint, I think there are better options out there. Yeah. But from a, if you have a finicky eater and this is all it will eat, uh, by, by all means, like, go for it. You know, first and foremost, the fish have to eat it, right? And if they don't eat it, doesn't matter how great the ingredients are. It's not going to do anything for them. I just love but, it as an auto feeder yeah. food. I don't think I've actually put it in an auto feeder. Because like, yeah. let's, let's say you yeah. gotta leave and there's no one to feed, and you gotta feed those discus. Auto feeder with yeah. that gets you through. All right, and then let's see. One of the last things you brought back some pistos from Peru. Yeah. And I think you're able to replicate them. So, I think we had about three to four different apisto species. Uh, these are two main holding tanks for kind of a you know the Thunderdome of apisto tanks that I haven't really been able to. Um, identify species wise but the two that I was able to be successful with um, initially put them in this tank and this is one has a pistogram of fry so the mom is still in here dad's next door um, she beat him up really really bad and oh. salt brought him back oh yeah there's fry in there yeah there's a, there's a good number of fry in there and then I know uh, last time you were here we were talking about how essentially the exact same tanks on you know in a fish room can have you know different stages of like algae progression. Yep. So some of it could be, I would imagine, is just the amount of nutrients in the water. So this tank will get fed heavier, does have more of a bio load, has mm -hmm. all the green algae all yep. over everything. This one, not so much. Right next to it, it's on the same exact light, same exact setting. So I'm gonna I'm gonna plug our own products here because your fish room is still in a hobbyist state where like mm -hmm. mine's converted over to the products we use. So you can see like one of the reasons we went with green tubing on ours as you can see the green algae growing on the tube right well when we made our sponge filters it's already green so you don't see that nearly as much and so he still has other types of sponge filters so you can see the difference there and then uh, we were talking earlier he's still using some of the oldest prototypes that we were testing and that would be this one here where it's still got fine yep flat or fine sponge and then the directional output. But as you can see, we tested the directional output and it just, it doesn't really direct the water. It just comes out and then just goes up. So mm -hmm. it didn't really perform the way we wanted it to, but we went through 
more than one uh, round of testing and that kind yeah. of stuff to get where we wanted to go. And uh, like, I don't really have many more of those anymore. Yeah. Um, where you, you still, you, you keep them, I guess. Cause I, we're up, we're up here we've got- I'm a hoarder. Some, some Zis, those are the nano ones, right? They're yeah. the smaller version of the Zis. Yeah, so that's the, I think the designations like ZB200 or 250 were the ones mm -hmm. that we sell are like the ZB300. Uh, they came out with this one after, you know, a few months after we launched yep. the ZB300. And in all honesty, um, even though this will fit better in a 10 gallon or a 20 long like they're in right now, they take probably 25% more air to, to push. Yeah. And that then makes them louder. So people already say that the Zis can be a little loud as it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that extra air to push it ends up making it a little bit more louder. And then this one yep. is a shorty. They try to address it again, yep. And they've got the directional um, output on there, but I still find that you know, with some internal changes they made and that output, it still ends up being a little loud. And then this is actually a full size this and a 10 gallon. So you can do it for anybody yeah. that cares, but I mean, it's pretty much you're at water. It's got to be like a bare bottom. And yeah. Is there anything you've got that you're like, oh, we didn't show off this. This is my favorite thing. Um, we're kind of covering it. You know, my, the point of my fish room is just specialization on a few different species and kind of turn it into a factory. Um, you know, some, some remnants, and I hate to even use that term, but I've got some Geophagus Pellegrini down there that are beautiful the geos. The giant autos are cool. The, gi the giant yeah. autos from Peru. So yeah. there's some cool stuff in here, but, you know, knowing kind of the direction I want this fish room to go, knowing that I want to crank out super red long fins, and just, you know, any co-op fan can go in and like, oh, you've got some of Randy's super reds? You know, yeah. Robert can point you in the right direction. From starting the fish room to where I'm at now, you know, a year, year and a half later, there's you know, all these things that, you know, you can watch all the videos of Dean or Eric Broadrock or any of these people that have had fish rooms forever, and you can try to pull the bits and pieces, but until you put it in your own fish room and start living it, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that's going to pop up that you never could have anticipated and that you never could have uh, learned, you know, unless you actually do it yourself. And so kind of every day is, is not even just with the fish, but the actual, you know, fish room itself. It's always, it's always learning. It's always the evolution. Yeah. Yep.